So good morning, everyone. My name is Paduma Ali, and I'm happy to be your master of ceremonies for our breakout session on water innovation. I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada, where I work as an urban planner and active member of the Water Youth Network. I have to say, as a generation, we are deeply disappointed about the environment, economy, and society we are inheriting. When it comes to water, members of our networks work side by side with governments and civil society to advocate for a sustainable development goal on water and sanitation. And we were extremely pleased and hopeful when SDG 6 was adopted with ambitious targets for safe water access, sanitation, water quality and efficiency, along with targets for water related ecosystems and water management. For the first time, we have globally negotiated targets that address the entire water cycle. In 2015, youth around the world celebrated the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, as we see how off-track countries are with SDG 6, we are deeply concerned. The Water Youth Network is creating a world where young people work together to become agents of change and ultimately improve the world's water situation. Our generation is leading the charge on water and climate change because although we have not created the problem, we will suffer the most severe consequences. I'm looking forward to learning how UN Water and the private sector are innovating to help achieve SDG 6, and I'll be taking the outcomes back to my youth partners, and I hope to share some inspiring ideas and solutions. So now onto some housekeeping. Our session today is only one hour, so I encourage all of our speakers to be concise. As I mentioned, we are focusing on innovation, and we'll hear first from the UN Water Vice Chair about the recently launched SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework. We will then move to a moderated panel, followed by closing remarks by the Under Secretary General of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So in the interest of time, rather than lengthy introductions, please find the biographies of all of our excellent speakers on the, on the event webpage. And just so you all know, you're able to double click on the speaker's window for a full screen. This will be useful when, whenever someone is sharing a slide or else it won't be viewable. And without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce the UN Water Vice Chair, Oche Unver. Oche, you have the floor. Thank, thank you for um, I'm, I'm, Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I apologize for not being able to send you my video. That there must be a technical glitch, but I'm happy that you can hear me at least. Um, so let, let me first thank the co-hosts, UN DESA and the UN Global Compact CEO Water Mandate and my uh, fellow panelists and participants for joining the breakout session. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you as, on behalf of uh, UN Water as the Vice Chair. Um, as, as many of you know, uh, the UN Water is the coordination mechanism in the UN system, aiming to deliver as one for water and sanitation. We work to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal number six, aimed at ensuring the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. We know that the global demand for water is rising, water resources are becoming more and more polluted, and SDG 6 is far off track. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, agriculture, which accounts for around 70% of global freshwater withdrawals, was getting thirstier, as were industry, manufacturing, and energy sectors, often leaving poorer communities with insufficient and unsafe water resources and inadequate sanitation. If accelerating the progress towards achieving SDG 6 was critical in January, then today it is a pivotal emergency that will define generations. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted virtually every aspect of our lives and it has clearly revealed the results of inaction. Chronic underfunding has left the poor more vulnerable than ever with a first line of defense against virus. Simple hand washing unavailable for billions of people globally. We now have a unique opportunity to build back better. Water and sanitation is a key component of response and the recovery from COVID-19. This July, through the COVID three members and four day partners, UN Water launched the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework at the UN High Level Political Forum. The framework emphasizes a new way of working together for all sectors of government, the UN system, civil society and the private sector. 
A new added value is an increased focus on concrete country and regional support. If we can um, share this slide, um, I'm not sure if I can do it from here, but one of my colleagues could do that. Our session is short, so I'm sharing a, a slide identifying the five accelerators uh, to drive the progress, and my colleagues are sharing the link to the Global Acceleration Framework in the chat box. I encourage the participants to also check out the SPG6 action space where we capture ideas, actions, and work solutions in an active, in an interactive learning platform. Today, we are focusing on the innovation accelerator, one of the five accelerators of the framework. To accelerate progress, we need to work and operate in new ways, which means that innovation, whether in science, emerging technologies, governance, or business models, can significantly improve water and sanitation management. With a focus on scaling up best practices and relevant innovation to countries, regions, and globally, this accelerator aims to enable innovative practices and technologies to be country level. We rely on the private sector to innovate as a critical engine for innovation, technologies, and investment, engaging business to both act responsibly and take action to support water and sanitation great potential to accelerate the pace of change. Before I give the floor back to Faduma, I'd like to touch on one area where innovation is making a major impact on SDG 6. This is wastewater. Wastewater from households and industries degrades water quality, poses a risk to public health, and limits opportunities for safe and productive. Wastewater is grossly undervalued as a potentially affordable and sustainable source of water, energy, nutrients, and other recoverable materials. In addition, the costs of wastewater management are greatly outweighed by the benefits to human health, economic development, and environmental sustainability providing new business opportunities and creating more green jobs. Environmental engineering is showing that wastewater testing can determine the presence of COVID-19 and water authorities are in discussions with businesses about pandemic through the viruses in this sewage. Our panelists are looking for innovation cultural supply chain, working closely with farmers and farmers, increasingly looking into non-conventional water resources, such as wastewater, whether due to its high nutrient content or a lack of conventional water resources. If applied safely, wastewater is a valuable source of both water and nutrients, contributing to water and food security and livelihood improvements the implementation of circular economy. This is but one of the many examples, and I very much look forward to hearing private sector representatives and using innovation to drive sustainable outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting could not have come at a better time. We need ambition and vision, and we need to act for a sustainable water future for everyone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ochai. I especially like the SDG6 action space. I'm sure the Water Youth Network will contribute. And now I'm happy to hand over to the head of the UN Global Compact CEO Water Mandate, Jason Morrison, who will moderate our panel discussion. Jason, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Faduma. Thank you, Ochai. Uh, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Morrison. I serve as the head of the Sea Water Mandate, uh, which is a partnership between the UN Global Compact and the Pacific Institute that goes back to 2007. Uh, and today, uh, the co-organizing entity for uh, this event is the Water Resilience Coalition, which is a flagship initiative of 
the seal water mandate that launched this year. Uh, many of our attendees may not be familiar with this initiative, so I'm going to introduce it using today's theme, uh, innovation. Um, at the core of the coalition is the recognition by its members that we need to dramatically elevate the ambition and accelerate the action on water. Um, implicit in that is that uh, the status quo is insufficient uh, and we need to innovate solutions that can drive impact at scale. The starting point for the coalition it are commitments, enterprise level commitments made by the member companies that are both quantifiable and time bound. Uh, and in fact, uh, a portion of these commitments speak directly to SDG 6. In fact, four of the targets of SDG 6 on wash, water quality and availability are, are addressed directly. Uh, and in, indirectly, the other four targets uh, through the programmatic approach to the initiative. Um, I want to talk about innovation uh, and how this uh, initiative is, uh, is innovating in a number of different ways, perhaps starting with newfound ways of collaborating and partnering. Uh, and a perfect example of that is a campaign that is launching today, a partnership uh, between the WRC and WaterAid. Uh, called the Water is Resilience uh, campaign, which is a call to action for companies to take urgent uh, action to accelerate water access and hygiene solutions and to move that to the top of the corporate agenda in light of uh, COVID-19. And I hope our panelists will talk a little bit uh, more about that. Uh, but the innovation uh, areas of the WRC actually uh, touch on a number of the other uh, action um, pillars of the SDG 6 acceleration framework. And I want to speak a little bit about those. Uh, one is about data and information. Uh, through partnership with the World Resources Institute and the Nature Conservancy, we're using data in new ways to uh, select the basins uh, through which the coalition members will work together on water, as well as the ways of prioritizing the key water challenges in those, uh, in those basins uh, that are uh, addressing the most acute water challenges in that context. We're also uh, innovating in new collective action and co-financing structures for those collective action initiatives that will emerge in these basins. And since the companies shared uh, share a long-term goal and set of goals on water, that enables our ability to then account for and track the impact of these collective action initiatives in basins using common metrics as measured against basin outcomes. All of those are uh, very uh, innovative in my mind. So today we're, our panelists are gonna talk, I think not only uh, Olchai, as you mentioned around some of the innovations in water use uh, and, uh, and uh, wastewater and water quality solutions. Uh, I know that that is uh, the subject of a number of our panelists remarks today, but also the way that there are innovative approaches to collaboration and innovative ways of investing in basins that have co-benefits for water, but also uh, climate mitigation, biodiversity, and uh, community and social economic livelihood. So I look forward to that. Um, we've had a little bit of technical difficulties with one of our panelists still trying to come in. So I'm going to immediately turn first, Kate, to you, Kate Gibson from Diageo, to talk a little bit about how your company has been innovating uh, in ways around water in alignment with achieving SDG 6. Great. Thanks very much, Jason. And um, so, yes, yeah, so my name is Kate Gibson, and I, uh, I am the Global Director for Diageo and Society. Um, and for those of you who um, may not be familiar with us, we're, um, we're a company uh, producing beverages. Uh, so, so for us, uh, water and SDG 6 is a very long-standing focus for us. Um, we operate uh, in, uh, we have 200 brands in 180 countries, um, and we also operate in many water stressed areas. So corporate water stewardship has been a very big focus uh, for us for over 20 years, um, and we're very passionate about uh, this incredibly precious resource and SDG 6 in particular, and very happy to see the um, acceleration framework here and the real focus um, on SDG 6. Certainly our experience has shown the, the benefits that you see in terms of resilience uh, of communities and also of business. Um, and I think we all recognize just how linked they are. Um, 
but certainly our experience and, and it's working across four areas of water stewardship and sourcing. Uh, obviously, uh, as a company using agricultural raw materials, uh, it's mission critical for us and we do see the impact uh, of climate change in our own operations in terms of achieving water efficiency um, and also replenishing the water we use uh, in communities around our business. Um, and also a focus on, on wash uh, and advocacy as well. And I think certainly our learnings um, and over the past uh, decade through, for example, 250 projects across 18 countries in Africa and India is that um, individual action uh, is not enough. And certainly I would, I would echo Jason's comments around innovation, uh, both in the technology space, but also in terms of collaboration uh, is the next frontier. And I think the acceleration framework gives the private sector um, something to, to, to base its decisions on and a way for people to, to, to come together. And certainly that's one of the um, benefits that we see as a founding member of the WRC, um, you know, in terms of the ability to have a common set of goals uh, and also really to collaborate um, at the basin level. And then I guess the, the, the other thought I would share is, um, and why we are uh, definitely welcome the campaign being launched today around um, water resilience uh, along with water aid, which is a longstanding partner of ours, is the real recognition that um, wash uh, in communities has such an incredible uh, benefit in terms of, um, of resilience and also poverty alleviation. And, and obviously, as been said before, um, COVID has really demonstrated the, 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 the very uh, pressing need to make sure that it's embedded across company operations, across communities, across sourcing communities, um, and is a real rising focus. Um, so we certainly, in the, the many years we've been partnering with WaterAid, um, we have um, definitely, you know, we've had a partnership that's really uh, helped us to see the unlock um, that a focus on WASH can have. Um, and I was also delighted to see in the acceleration framework, um, the focus particularly on women and girls um, and the, the power that you see of women and girls taking part in being upskilled to manage those water resources. Um, just one story from our, our standpoint um, in Nigeria, which is um, a place we've been engaged in WASH projects for over 20 years now. Um, when we go back and visit those projects and we assess them, um, we I think one of the things that we've been you know, incredibly uh, proud of and very pleasantly surprised by is to see uh, the longevity of them, but also see the way that the... Um, the way that the community has has embraced those projects and also the unlock in terms of poverty alleviation um, that we see as a result. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted that this framework is out there, that this panel is happening today um, and look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kate. Let me turn uh, immediately to Eric. Uh, I know has been uh, taking on a, a number of innovative strategies, uh, both about investments in watersheds uh, and engaging in your supply chain uh, and, and doing so in a way that um, uh, looks to, um, uh, to realize the co-benefits associated with uh, investments in water. So Eric, can you share a little bit of how you guys are innovating around this issue? Well, thank you, Jason. And it's, a, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. So for, first of all, I think when, when I think about water for us, of course, uh, in Danone, water is, is one of our business line, but it's also an essential in everything we do as a, as a food and drink company. And, uh, and we all know that it's one of the most precious resource, not only on the resource standpoint, but also because it's an incredible connector of the ecosystems in which we are operating. And I think fundamentally what we see in the way uh, we are addressing water in, a, in a, our way not only to innovate, but also to manage this precious resource, is a, the fundamental link with uh, the localities and the geographies in which we are operating and the management of this resource. Uh, this territorial aspect of how you manage uh, basically the water resource is one of the uh, key essential, and it, it has been part uh, of our DNA since the very uh, uh, beginning in Danone, uh, as early as 1972, our CEO declared that the mission of our company was both economic and social. And the social dimension of managing water, as uh, uh, our friend uh, uh, earlier uh, stated uh, today, is, is absolutely essential. There is a cultural element in water that is very important. And that's part of the way you have and you can innovate when you think about water. Because you cannot manage this resource without the communities around uh, the way you are operating. 
And this is at the core of uh, our water policy, is ready to look at first, uh, how you preserve the resource with local communities, how you make sure uh, that uh, basically you use uh, the, the water resource in the, the most efficient way, because that's uh, uh, our commitment, uh, and how you can uh, restore and regenerate the ecosystems. Uh, when I was talking about the link, uh, uh, I can give you an example of, of project where, uh, for instance, in East Java uh, in Indonesia, uh, where we have some of our water uh, units there. Uh, we are managing on the Bromo volcano, uh, uh, basically an area where we have worked with local communities first to stop the erosion uh, linked to agriculture at the top of the volcano uh, by changing the agriculture practices, by stopping deforestation. Uh, then you need to manage the water resource at the middle, uh, where people consume the water resource. And finally, at the bottom, where there is the rice fields and the rice fields that are using the water. So it, it leads us as a company, uh, uh, basically uh, valuing this precious resource to work with these communities that are fundamentally outside what would be perceived as a traditional supply chain. And I think that's where the innovation is, because you need to, to, try to work with the rice uh, growers you need to work with the, the potato growers at the top of the volcano to reduce the deforestation. And this is basically uh, the ecosystems you need, you need to manage. Uh, and finally, uh, and we have discussed with the, the CEO Waterman that many times about that. When you talk about water for a company, uh, the, one of the next mile of innovation is really monetizing uh, the externalities that what earth is. I mean, there is a, a fundamental paradox today, is where the water is a scarcer, this is also where the water has no not enough value. So we need to find a way uh, to change this paradigm. Uh, and we need to find a way to bring back value in the way the resources manage and the positive externalities uh, that water is generating. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, one of our colleague was mentioning around biodiversity, carbon sequestration. When you protect wetlands, for instance, you store carbon uh, in the soil. So this is an all very interesting areas, working with communities, but also creating the conditions to make sure that the ecosystems are valuing water for the service it renders. And this is absolutely uh, important to connect with the mission of a private company. Fantastic, uh, Eric. That's a great uh, and succinct, clear. Um, so, Anya, welcome. I'm glad that you were able to overcome the technical hurdles, and I'd like to go over to you next because I know that uh, the Clean Climate Fund has been looking at more innovative instruments around financing and investing to accelerate progress on SDG six. Maybe you can share some of that experience with us. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you today. Sorry, I was a little bit late there. Uh, I want to share with you some of the journey that GCF has been on. So in the first four full years of GCF operation, um, that's from 2015 to 2019, GCF invested a total of 5.6 billion US dollars. Um, and that was in 123 different climate adaptation and mitigation projects in developing countries around the world. Um, the con contribution towards specifically water-focused projects within that was a total of $607 million for 17 projects. And it's interesting to see where those projects are um, which sectors those projects are located in. If you look at um, the different subsectors of, of water, about half of them were actually for water supply, sanitation and hygiene projects, and mostly in small island developing states. That is where water scarcity is very acute. For example, in the Marshall Islands, where the water supplies um, are mostly underground and they can get totally swamped by um, sea level rise and, and uh, storm surges. So 
there was a point where the Marshall Islanders were having to have water delivered to them by tanker. And GCF is supporting the investments in rainwater harvesting and solar water desalination on the islands. Um, we have a further 40% that was invested in integrated water resources management um, across the board. And then we had about 13% of that total investment into flood protection and a rather smaller amount, 3% into protection against drought. But I have to say that these were the projects which were purely focused on water. We also have a number of other projects in the areas of agriculture where, for example, a component of that project would be innovative irrigation. The, the private sector would have quite a large role to play. But if we look just at the, um, the water projects, one of the things that is very clear is that we still have a limited private investment from the water sector and largely in terms of grants. Um, so a lack of application of other kinds of financial instruments. And in this first replenishment period now of GCF with the new strategy, we're really looking to diversify the range of financial instruments which are used. GCF is also able to back, um, for instance, uh, guarantees. It's able to invest in equity um, and, of course, concessional loans as well. So we're looking to invest in projects um, which enable us to, to utilize these different types of financial instruments and then obviously link much more strongly with, um, with the private sector. And an example of this is in Southern Africa, where um, there's a, a big new project developing in terms of reclaiming domestic wastewater treatment and, and reclamation from 59 municipalities across South Africa. We're partnering with the Development Bank of Southern Africa and there are going to be bonds issued, backed by GCF finance, um, which will enable private investors to actually invest in these water treatment bonds. Um, we're looking to start to explore a number of other aspects um, and for investments which solve specific regional water issues. Um, and where we see water scarcity becoming an increasing problem, we see these types of projects with wastewater treatment and recovery, um, aquifer storage and recharge can be areas where the private sector is really able to invest. Thank you very much. Great. And I, I think that thread on uh, innovations around co-financing will come back through uh, at, at, uh, in the dialogue portion. Uh, just want to uh, uh, encourage uh, uh, attendees that have any questions to uh, include them in the chat function. I hope we'll have a time to take a couple of those toward the end. But let me uh, turn, Samantha, to you to talk a little bit uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, the, an apparel brand that's been leading on water. And I know working not only throughout your value chain, but collaborating in innovative ways with uh, local communities, uh, as uh, Eric has talked about Danon's work. Perhaps you can share some of those experiences with us. Sure. Um, well, thank you all first for having me. Um, it's great to be here. PVH, just for those who aren't familiar, is a large apparel manufacturer, and some of our leading brands include Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger. Um, so I first just wanted to echo some of the points and, and definitely on the collaboration piece. You know, we've long known and talked about collective action as being critical, saying it is easy, doing it is the hard part. Um, and just the second piece is we think about getting into those innovations, really excited about the work that the Water Resilience Coalition is, is primed to do with respect to, to metrics and consistent targets that will enable us to look at this work uh, more consistently and enable us then to evaluate the innovations coming, the technological and other solution innovations coming into the space and what works. So just from a PVH standpoint, 
Um, we look at water across our value chain, as Jason mentioned. We have a 2030, what we call our forward fashion strategy that has many targets across social and environmental issues. And, and three areas in which we really try to hit on water more specifically is one, we do work to remove hazardous chemicals from our supply chain. So that's working with the facilities um, to drive compliance with manufacturing restricted substances. Um, interestingly, I think there's some interesting innovation happening in the wastewater space. It was great to hear the comments on it earlier. Sometimes what we find, and there's some companies, one in particular called Sea Change that we've done some pilots with that I would encourage you to check out because they're doing some really cool work to try to streamline wastewater processes and simplify it. But sometimes what we find with wastewater and what's going on in the wet processing facilities for making clothes is that the wastewater treatment plants just simply, there's not clear knowledge about how to operate them. So while tech innovations can be really valuable, Sometimes the innovations around capacity building and helping to upskill um, and ensure there's the right people in place to run the system is really critical. Then, uh, what, then we also look at water. We have a target uh, related to uh, collective action, where we work in. We're due to work in five basins uh, as we get to 2025. We currently work in four areas. Um, in southern India, in Hawassa, Ethiopia, in China, and in Vietnam, very much linked to where we are um, have a heavy concentration for our sourcing. And so that's where we've had the opportunity working with the water mandate, with WWF, with GIZ, to really dig into the local needs of those communities. Um, and each stage was different, but one of the projects I'll just speak to um, that we find to be really exciting is with respect to the work in southern India um, in the Noyal River Basin. That was an area with a high concentration of textile production uh, where work really hadn't started and there was a need to begin a lot of research um, looking at the different aspects of the river basins, which was done with WWF, and start to do river health assessments and figure out what different interventions could be. And what's been really exciting as we start that path and we're starting to identify, or not we, but really it's WWF who's been a phenomenal partner where there have been some great collaborations with the CEO water mandate to look at testing out context-based targets with that work. Also bringing in, a, uh, WWF, I wanna make sure I give them credit for bringing in HSBC and IKEA, which is invaluable and in having more parties at the table. Um, but as we really start to look at some of those solutions, what we're finding is that they will not only address the water quality and the watershed issues, but they have positive impacts for biodiversity. They have some really interesting, there's some potential then to look at can we lean in on some of those solutions and even translate those into be future materials or feedstocks? I'm talking in a real potential space here, um, but for fibers. So really thinking about uh, the work, the water stewardship work as being a link into other environmental impacts um, in addition to climate change. And so I think there's a lot of innovative collaboration there that started. We're really excited for that to expand and then to think about how solving those different problems open up new opportunities for different environmental impacts. Great. So uh, I want to get into a little bit more of now, uh, after our prepared remarks, uh, uh, a more interactive discussion among the panelists. Um, Samantha, you talked a little bit about uh, how, in some instances, when working with your supply chain partners, in order to um, scale the uptake of technology, there really needs to overcome a, a capacity uh, issue, and and that that is the challenge that needs to be addressed in order to accelerate the progress. And I want to turn to you, Kate, to see if you can identify what some of the challenges that you face when you've been trying to pioneer, or innovate, and really accelerate the action on water and not only what the challenges have been, but any solutions you guys have found to overcome those challenges? Um, yeah, no, it's a great question. I think, um, I mean, I guess to think about this from a sort of, uh, there's an internal lens as, as a change maker within a big global company, and then there's the external lens as well. And then obviously the two intersect. I think one of the um, that we've seen the challenge seen over the past 20 years is, um, is obviously the, the the link between you know global scale strategies and then the very context based 
uh, aspects of water. Anyone working uh, in this space will will no doubt be familiar with that. Um, and I think the other aspect on it, and it was mentioned earlier around this very precious resource not being uh, priced in a way uh, that reflects the very precious nature of it um, and also the devolved administration in many cases of water. So it does create a challenge around uh, making the case internally um, for, for, for investment. But I certainly, the way that we've found to overcome that is, and this is very much, you know, through work with our partners and through that the experience we've had is, is all the many benefits that you see across the resilience of your business, across the health and resilience of your workforce, across the social um, and economic development of sourcing landscapes and really getting the sourcing aspect into it. And then also the local community as well. And it, it's one of those things that does create over time a virtuous circle where you have more and more evidence of the many different benefits that you see it make, making the case for future bolder um, action easier. Um, but but that's, that's sort of 20 years type of experience on that front. Um, and I think the other um, challenge that we see um, is, uh, and again, is, is the, the water climate change nexus, I think is something that you know, we're, we're all very aware of, um, but there is a temptation to want to focus on one or the other. And, and you certainly see those, those type of competing priorities. So again, it's around making the case, if you, for example, around innovation, around drought resistant crops. You know, we've talked a bit about, you know, the power of um, the power of nature-based solutions in terms of helping communities, in terms of the preservation of water and in terms of the, the economic development as well. So I think it's making sure that you have that multifaceted conversation um, so that you can make the case. And then, as I as I would say, with regards to the, on the external landscape, um, you know, one of the challenges, and we've talked a lot about it already, is you know, it's easy to talk about collaboration. Actually, doing it is very hard. Um, and again, so this is why innovations like um, the WRC are very helpful in the sense of prioritizing basins and actually having a common set of data that allow you to figure out where does that fit in your priorities? What action are you going to take? And, and actually to be able to build onto something. I think we've had a period of time where people have been acting alongside each other uh, in priority areas, but haven't actually really been collaborating. So I think, um, you know, obviously there's very urgent action needed there. So I think the more, the more common framework and data that we have um, will make that private sector case easier uh, to engage in. Fantastic. Um, I want to pivot to you, Eric, uh, and I know you, you guys have been innovating in many dimensions around water and, and in fact, as a company uh, and your business model and, and becoming a big corporation. Um, but I want to focus on a specific area where I know you guys have spent a lot of time in thinking, and it links to your earlier remarks around uh, trying to really uh, better capture the value of water and to monetize those benefits of uh, investment in watersheds in ways that uh, can um, realize those multiple benefits uh, across climate mitigation, the integration that you were, that Kate was mentioning, uh, and how to think about those multifaceted dimensions. So when you're when you've been pursuing that work, that investment that you've been doing investments in basins around soil health and uh, nature-based solutions generally, what are some of the challenges that you find as you're pioneering in that? And what are some of the ways over those uh, uh, those challenges and obstacles? Very good. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, I think, first of all, I see there is a question for me in the chat. So uh, as you, uh, as you uh, nicely proposed, uh, I'm going to try to answer this question from Laura and, and Simran uh, asking, how do we manage basically our, basically our watershed? I mean, uh, are we uh, uh, and the sources that we are uh, we are exploiting? I think uh, fundamentally, uh, what we we believe in regeneration of, of natural resources. I think we are, and this is why we have uh, embarked into a regenerative agriculture strategy. But we follow exactly the same logic for water. We have uh, teams of uh, hydrogeologists uh, that uh, basically uh, ensure that we never take more than what what, what nature can restore. So this is uh, really the fundamental way we are uh, working everywhere we operate. And this is opening exactly to uh, your question, which is uh, what dimension of, of basically this resource we need to, to take into account in, our, in, our, in the way we operate on a water basin. 
And we are not alone on a water basin. Most of the time, and I mean every time, we are a very, very, very small uh, off-taker of the water in the water basin. But nevertheless, it is important that we steward this resource at the best possible. So we use basically uh, our networks very often to catalyze energy uh, around the management of the water resource. I can take an example in Evian, for instance, in France, where for the last 20 years, we have created a very specific collaboration with farmers, municipalities that gather into an association to manage the full area that, by the way, has been, has been uh, uh, validated as a Ramsar site alongside the process uh, to make sure that we protect basically this ecosystem um, down to the fact that we are co-financing, for instance, a methanizer to limit the usage of pesticide and fertilizer on this basin. So this is an example. Another example of, of cross-collaboration that we're having, and this is social innovation, is the source we have in Argentina with Villa Vicencio. That is another, by the way, Ramsar site. That is a reserve that we are protecting and uh, that has been uh, uh, also qualified as a Ramsar site three years ago. So these are two examples uh, where uh, I think the innovation you're calling uh, uh, about, Jason, is really about making sure that uh, when we are working with local communities, uh, we don't shy away from our responsibility, but we need to open collaboratively. That means that a company had to open its governance to other type of, uh, uh, of interest. It has to open its governance to other type of timing. When I talk about a 20-year partnership, you know, when you think that you're a listed company and you need to report every quarter, like many of my colleagues today, you know, it's another timeline. But this is the timeline you need to consider to manage a natural resource. And uh, that's very often the difficulty we're facing as uh, I would say sustainability professional uh, is this uh, a tragedy of horizon. So you need to integrate that in your business model and find a way to share uh, uh, the value differently. So I go back again to, to, to one of the things that I believe is very true. And I think the point that Anya was, was making is very interesting. We need also to create new financial stream, uh, financial mechanism to make sure uh, basically this long-term management of the resource is entering into the economic equation of corporates. Uh, and, and that's, that's uh, and, I, I, and I will stop here. There is one battle that uh, I, I am following right now, which is, I don't understand why a constant standard now, when I invest into gray infrastructure, I have the capacity to depreciate it. But when I invest in green infrastructure, protecting a water basin, it is basically eating my PNL. The year, I'm, it's not an investment, it's an expense. Well, in, fa in fact, you're investing in nature. And the good thing when you invest in nature is that it's appreciating. When you invest in green infrastructure, it's depreciating. So we need to change the system of thinking here. Huh? So, uh, and, and this, is, this is how you can create nature value. And, and I think the coalition we're talking about today is ready for me about that. Uh, it's putting great minds together like today, ready to create these synergies and, and invent a way to, uh, uh, to, to channel different stream of financing. And, and I think I'm very impressed with some of the examples my colleague have described. There is a commonality of thinking we need to gather and make it a reality. Fantastic, and I can't resist immediately, Anya, to turn to you. Uh, you had mentioned in your prepared remarks that, uh, that you're moving uh, in the Green Climate Fund toward structures that are more conducive to collaboration with private sector finance. Uh, you spoke of some examples of that in in Southern Africa and South Africa specifically. Um, what, building on some of Eric's remarks, what do you think are some of the challenges to these new to to, to scaling uh, these new collaborative structures that involve more uh, co-financing from private sector entities? Well, from our perspective, well, I think the issues is that um, climate risks are not yet being priced in by companies um, looking ahead at their water security you know, looking at changes in precipitation, um, looking at what's happening um, 
in terms of you know potential droughts and and having to look for more innovative water resources um, and investing in developing those so what we're trying to do is to create awareness around these climate risks and um, to encourage companies to to look at the longer term um, we think that you know that there's um, there are a lot of risks ahead which which are not being properly priced in to people's balance sheets um, so we're uh, the the sort of instruments which are which are the most popular right now are um, to have green bonds um, or water bonds around um, investing in also nature-based solutions around protecting wetlands that sit on top of aquifers for example and so on um, but i think going forward we're going to need to look more at um, developing equity instruments where gcf could actually invest in helping to de-risk new investments in in developing um you know innovative water resources alternative unconventional water which includes reclaiming wastewater and so on um yeah i i really think that that going forward um as climate change starts to bite harder we're going to start to see much more of an awareness of these kinds of risks and and an awareness by companies to be able to you know to 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 be willing to invest more also in issues such as climate information to simply have the data to participate in early warning systems mm. um to start protecting their supply chains from climate risks and so mm. on and yeah so gcf wants to participate in in de-risking some of these investments that companies are going to have to be making Sure. And let me use that uh, input to pivot a little bit to Sam and maybe trying to take a little bit of a longer view. Um, sure. Anya, you talk about how sure. perhaps the business case isn't there because companies aren't satisfactorily pricing in climate risk and its implications for water uh, and don't really therefore have the strong business case they need. But as we think longer term, Samantha, and we try to think about how we really scale action on water uh, and yeah. what are uh, gonna be some of the in, in, in actions that will need to happen to move beyond the, let's call it uh, 10 to 20 dozen companies that really get water that are leading on water, but how we need to kind of get over to mainstream the action on a longer term horizon. What do you think are some of the key things that need to be done in order to move the needle at scale? Yeah, so I would say about four yeah. things. It's a great question. And can you hear me okay? Smell my audio, my audio, yeah. my audio good? Okay, great. Um, so first and foremost, I think it's, I, I totally agree with the pricing of externalities. I think that's a complicated, not only challenge, but then a communication challenge to, help companies, especially those who aren't um, as immersed or committed into within sustainability to understand. So I think while that work is going on, connecting this work into the business continuity and risk management work is really critical. Um, and linking that in to help businesses think about how to start addressing those from a, a risk standpoint. Um, I think, you know, and, and I'm speaking from an apparel standpoint, but we have, as we're looking at ways to measure um, water impacts and from a, I know the local context-based standpoint, how can we set that up? So apparel has a number of industry tools that we use to measure performance that now are starting to be translated into how we talk to the consumer. And so our business leaders are gonna wanna know as these new water metrics are coming up, how do we work those in to our ways of evaluating impact that ultimately translate to the people we're trying to sell goods to, um, in addition to other stakeholders who are asking about these impacts from investors to wholesale customers and you name it. Um, so I think those are two big areas. And I, and I guess to build a little bit more, I think the metrics piece, um, and we've talked about this, Jason, you know, where climate has these metrics and um, water hasn't 
the community hasn't been able necessarily to articulate those in the same way. Not that climates are perfect, but I think once we get we dive into this work with uh, the Water Resilience Coalition and consider and find more ways to put quantifiable metrics to the business community behind what we're doing, even to show the wins, because I think also there's a lot of power in capturing these anecdotes and stories of success, but being able to have metrics behind them, but consistent metrics across the water stewardship projects will um, be really invaluable. So those are some of the, the pieces that come to mind um, as I think about that. Um, and I think about that both from a collective action standpoint and from a WASH standpoint as well. Fantastic. Um, we have about four minutes of working time, three to four minutes before we hand it back uh, to Paduma. And we have one question, and I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. I know some of you have already got a lot of experience in this, so we'll see if people can offer a few reflections quickly, and then more than one can come in on the question. But it's a question uh, that was raised uh, by an attendee around, there's a lot of uh, mention of innovation and new partnerships and collaboration, but not a lot of mention of how that collaboration interfaces with the public sector, whether that be local government, perhaps catchment authorities, national government, and or multilaterals. Um, we know that lasting change on water links back fundamentally to governance and water management, integrated water resource management planning, climate uh, adaptation planning, for example. Can someone speak a little bit to the road ahead as you see it relating back to collaboration with public sector? And and if you could do it in a minute, that'd be great. <laughs> Any quick thoughts? I can I can quickly throw out, I think it's hyper local, depending on obviously the region in which you're working. I would say for us, we've worked in Hawassa, Ethiopia with the government, there was a common interest in bringing the apparel industry there, but doing it in a way that was sustainable in the broadest sense, but also in an environmental sense. So I think when you're working with common goals, we've had government at the table in addition to a lot of other local stakeholders. Um, so I think starting with common goals, um, it's a little bit of a trite point, but I think wherever you can, and then bringing those into conversation um to get the local government actors at the table but it's absolutely critical and uh, there's a number of different examples depending on which region and jurisdiction you're looking in that would be my yeah. Quick thought. yeah and it links back to your uh, point about showing the wins it feels like you, you have to have a willing partner in the public sector and when you see the leaders that are the corollary leaders for the public sector to the leaders in the private sector and you can align in that locality on on shared goals that's when I think you can just demonstrate those wins and successes and bring others along. Uh, Kate, Eric, uh, Anya, any quick reflections on this before we wrap up? No, I would, I would think I would echo the points raised that we certainly have had experience. Um, just one example would be with um, the new brewery that we built in Kenya, the Sumo Brewery was certainly something where we partnered very closely with, um, with the Kenyan government on a national level. And I think one of the things that was the real unlock there was the recognition that um, there were multiple benefits in terms of more drought resistant uh, jobs and life, like water stewardship and community development all wrapped up um, in, in, in one development and, and, and it, able to think, you know, very much long term about the multiple benefits that we saw. So I think it is it is around, you know, the, before that the cost of doing nothing in this space is not nothing, but also the benefits of doing something in this space are, are, are actually quite varied and so it's really finding the partners that can really tap into those very benefits and, and to have a collective vision. Uh, oh, well said. That hyper-local and connecting it to the multifaceted discussion beyond water. Eric, you had, uh, we're also going to come in and perhaps give you yeah. the last remarks. So I, th I think two thoughts from my side. So I think very often, not everywhere, but in many of our mineral uh, water source, in fact, we have what is called a delegation of service. And I like this idea that we are here to steward the resource. And I think at the center of the collaboration with, with public authorities, I think there needs to be science also. Uh, hydrogeology, to make sure that you put the interest, the capacity of the resource to restore at the center of the discussion, to create a, 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 a delegation of service. Because we are here to steward this resource for the next generation. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's probably the place where 
all parties can agree. Pol companies, citizens, municipalities, uh, and, and, and I, it's very important, I think, uh, sometimes to, to, to go out of an emotional discussion, which is, has to be emotional, because this is one of the most precious resources we have, put back science, but make sure that the objective is really to steward the resource for the next generation. So that's, that's what I believe is, is at the core of, of, of a good stewardship journey. Great, fantastic. Yeah. So, um, and if I could yeah, just come please, in very um, quickly, I, I think that creating these vehicles for blended finance for the public and the private finance, we're going to start to see more and more of this as water becomes more scarce, particularly cities heading towards day zero. You get the multiplier effect from treating and reusing um, domestic and industrial wastewater, and I think that the public finances is essential to kickstart those sorts of investments, but then leverage the private finance to come in yes. to be able to actually realize the gains of this multiplier effect of reclaiming water. We're going to start seeing more and more of this around the world. Thank Indeed. You. And one of the things I've, I've noticed about that blended finance approach is uh, the insistence that the business community has when they invest on having trackable uh, metrics and outcomes and therefore built in accountability to those types of approaches. So we've got a couple of minutes over. Back to you, Fedoma. It looks like we have uh, Nicholas from UNDESA might be taking us home with the closing remarks. But Fedoma, back to you. Thank you. So thank you so much for all of our panelists, to Jason for expertly guiding the discussion. Now for closing remarks, um, I was honored to introduce the Assistant Secretary General for DESA, Maria Francesca, but she is experiencing some, te some technical difficulties. So Nicholas, thank you for stepping in. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Paduma, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, I'm honored to deliver the statement of the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs, Affairs of the United uh, Nations Secretariat. Maria Francesca Scotolizano as prepared uh, for her delivery. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation in today's SDG Business Forum breakout session on untapped potential water innovation to advance the SDGs. I would like to thank our distinguished speakers for sharing their experiences as well as insightful messages and ideas. I would like to also thank UN Water and UN Global Compact for co-organizing together with UN DESA this timely and productive discussion under the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework. We have heard how important water, sanitation, and climate actions are if we want to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And we are aware of how essential private sector partnerships are in the water resilience. Yet, it is clear that under the current rate of progress, the world is not on track to achieve SDG 6 targets by 2030. Currently, around 2 billion people in the world are living in water stressed areas, and by 2050, the same will be true of more than half of the world's population if no action is taken. Therefore, th there is an urgent need for a significant and sustainable global response one which builds on lessons learned and maps a more resilient future. Moreover, the current global health crisis can be an opportunity for addressing and rectifying the continued failure to provide safe and affordable water and sanitation for all. Access to water and sanitation is a fundamental requirement for hygiene, thus global public health is contingent on secure water resources for all. The effects of COVID-19 intensified around the world. It was increasingly clear that we need to provide all people with essential services, especially on water and sanitation. A key accelerator in the SDG 6 acceleration framework is to leverage and scale up innovative technologies and practices at the country level. This is only possible through effective partnership with <laughs> With corporate innovations, the private sector can mitigate future distress and create more resilient communities. However, immediate and urgent action is needed in this regard. As discussed in the breakout session, addressing the issues of water and sanitation supplies, including collaboration with the government to ensure efficiency, adequacy, and, timeless, and time, uh, timeliness in the delivery of such critical public services, is crucial to achieving SDG 6. 
This session has highlighted many ways that innovation for water sanitation are helping to alleviate water stress, manage the COVID-19 response around the world, and build long-term resiliency. I believe that the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework will deliver fast results at a large scale, and if we increase investments in water and sanitation, we will produce multiple benefits for health, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. The United Nations system, in coordination with its private sector and multi-stakeholder partners, will unite international support to accelerate progress towards achieving SDG 6. Multilateral cooperation will be essential to upholding the guiding principles of the Global Acceleration Framework, such as prioritizing the vulnerable, inclusivity, conflict sensitivity, unleashing female and youth potential, planning for resilience, and designing and implementing transformations based on scientific evidence. At this point, I would like to commend those who have pledged support to the SDG 6 Acceleration Framework through the Water Resilience Coalition. You are vital to to our efforts in exploring how innovations in supply chain management, technology, and governance practices can advance the 2030 agenda. With compassion and in collective actions to address water, sanitation, and climate challenges, we can ensure sustainable recovery from the current water and health crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. It's been a pleasure to act as your master of ceremonies. I hope you are coming away inspired and helpful. On behalf of youth, please do all you can to achieve sustainable development goals. Our lives literally depend on it. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much, Paduma. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye.